Okay, thanks a lot. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, this is part nine of the um, teachings that I've developed on covenants. And um, I appreciate all the good words that uh, that you've gotten from um, from these teachings. I think they've gotten a little better as, I mean, I'm not a natural teacher and it's, it's a obsessive compulsive effort whenever I try to put one of these things together. Um, but anyway, uh, it's all started for me back in the spring Bible study and, and we started a series on covenants there. And it, it really helped me a lot in, in being able to see more clearly uh, the different sections of the Bible. I mean, prior to that, we learned about dispensations and things, but looking at the Bible through covenants to me is, is a very helpful way to look at that. Uh, one of the negatives, I mean, some people have what's called covenant theology, uh, and I don't completely understand what that is, but uh, it's basically understanding the, the different covenants and how they relate to each other and how the covenants all basically point to the new covenant, the older covenants. Uh, and dispensationalism, one of the negatives on dispensationalism is it's man-made. You know, people just look at the Bible and they divide it up into these different segments and, and you ask three or four different dispensationalists and you'll have different divisions. The Bible only talks about two dispensations, uh, the, the age of grace and the age to come. Those are really only the two dispensations that the Bible has. But when it comes to covenants, there are six covenants that God has with man, uh, but there's only three main covenants. Uh, and that is the Abrahamic mosaic and the new covenant. Those are the main covenants. And that's where we've been spending most of our time. There is a no Noahic covenant uh, and Davidic covenant and priestly covenant. Those are other covenants, but they are, aren't as impactful and don't have as much importance in pointing toward the new covenant and pointing toward Christ. So, Doug, I'm uh, sorry, could you repeat what was the three with man, Abrahamic and what? Abrahamic, Mosaic, and New Covenant. Those are the three main covenants. Okay. And so covenant is not a word that we use in everyday life. Uh, and I'm going to kind of review this a little bit because there's so many new people. So I apologize to the folks that have been coming along for so many months on this, but we'll do half of it's going to be on review and we'll do the other half on something new. Uh, but covenant's not a, a word we use in everyday life. It shows up in legal documents and things like that. Uh, and some people say, well, a covenant is just a contract. Well, it's really not just a contract. It's much more than that. Uh, it's based on promises and it's, it's more of a commitment. You know, a promise is something that we intend to do. When, when God promises something, he intends to do it. When God makes a covenant with you, he's committed to do it. And that's the same thing with, other, with two people. But now when it comes to God, a promise from God is just as good as a covenant. Because God can't lie, so he's, he's, he's good for his word. But anyway, that's a, that's a subtle difference there between those two things. Uh, and we'll see more about that as we go on today. So when it comes to a covenant in the Bible, there are generally four different characteristics of a covenant that we need to look for. One is the phraseology. Now, what I mean by that is when God does a covenant with man, he says, I'm doing a covenant. <laughs> okay, so he's clear about it my covenant with Abraham, my covenant with Israel, you know, my, the new covenant, those, you know, th those, it's clear when Jesus says at the last supper, he goes new covenant. Um, so it's clear. There's a phraseology that identifies what, what the covenant is, or I'm going to make a covenant, or I'm going to cut a covenant and cut a covenant had to, that was from the sacrifice of animals where animals would be cut in half. And the, the two people making the covenant would walk between the pieces. Uh, the second part that characterizes the covenant is promises or pledges. So within the covenant, uh, God is promising to do something, uh, or there's a pledge between two people of some kind. So those, we need to look for those. Like in the Noahic covenant, God promised uh, not to destroy the earth with water anymore. No more floods. And then we look for also in a covenant, there's usually some kind of a ceremony that, that documents the uh, covenant. And that ceremony usually involves sacrifice of some kind. So it usually sacrifice animals, or it could be like there was a covenant between Jonathan and, and David, where Jonathan gave David his armor. He pledged a gift. Okay. And then finally, we look for a sign. Now, covenants usually have some kind of a sign. Uh, we know that in the Abrahamic covenant, the sign was circumcision. 
In the Mosaic Covenant, the sign is the Sabbath. In the Noahic Covenant, the sign was the rainbow. So we look for a sign, and the purpose of the sign is so that when people see the sign, they remember the covenant. So that's the purpose, that's the purpose of having a sign of the covenant. So we'll start with the, with the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, there's four main principles in the Abrahamic covenant, uh, and those are that it's based on faith, it's based on promises, it's unconditional. God made the promises to Abraham, and the people of Israel did not have to comply unless they wanted the benefits of the covenant. And finally, it's permanent. Now, the only covenant, which is, and the Bible describes this as everlasting. There's clear verses that say, this is my everlasting covenant. That applies to all the covenants except for Mosaic. There's no verse that says that the Mosaic covenant is everlasting. And in fact, we're going to see that the, that the Mosaic covenant is temporary. Okay. Um, so let's start with uh, kind of showing some scripture that helps with that uh, understanding of those four principles. So the Abrahamic covenant is based on faith. So turn to Genesis uh, chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. So in verse five, so this is the Abrahamic covenant. And this is the section in chapter 15 explains most of the covenant promises and has the ceremony and has all that stuff. We're not going to go through all the ceremony verses and stuff. But these are the, th the main parts of the covenant uh, in verses 5, 6, and 7. And in verse 5, it says, Yahweh brought him, Abram, outside and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them, he said to Abraham so your seed will be. So this is the first part of the covenant has to do with Abraham's seed or his offspring. So remember, Abram and Sarah were childless. And at that point, they were both older and didn't look like they were going to have any kids. So Yahweh tells Abram, so shall your seed be. And then verse six, Abraham believed in Yahweh. He believed in Yahweh and he credited, he Yahweh credited it to him as righteousness one of the most important verses in the Bible, that Abraham's faith in God was credited to him as righteousness. And then this carries on to the New Testament, where our faith in Christ is credited to us as righteousness. Okay. And then in verse 7, he said to him, he said to, God said to Abraham, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. So those are the three components there of the Abrahamic com co covenant. There are some other promises in there, but these are the three main things, is that God promised descendants, that Abram was given righteousness based on his faith, and that Yahweh promised to give him the land he was on. So he had already come to Canaan at that point, uh, and God had made those promises to him. And in the Old Testament, uh, righteousness equaled eternal life. So that to have eternal life, you had to be righteous. So when you see in the Old Testament, and it's true in the New Testament too, but there was two types of people. There was the righteous and the wicked. And in the New Testament, there's the righteous uh, and the unbelievers. <laughs> So, uh, so when, when it says that God credited to him his righteousness, it was his promise to have life in the age to come, in the future. So then uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant is developed all the way through this, uh, the, the, when you first hear about Abraham, all the way through to, to this section we're going to read in Genesis 22. Genesis 22 section about the covenant is uh, probably the one most referred to because during this segment, God is swearing, taking an oath to fulfill his promise. And that's referred back to many times in, in, the, in the New Testament. And so when you go to verse 22 or chapter 22, now this is the segment where uh, God is testing Abraham. 
Now I think of testing not to find out whether Abraham is, has faith or not, but to show the world that Abraham does have faith. So this is a proof to the world that Abraham has faith. And so you remember he took Isaac up there. He was going to put him on the pile of wood. He tied him up. And he was getting ready to kill him. And the angel says, stop, and provided a ram, and they sacrificed the ram. And so at, then we're going to read uh, beginning in verse 15. This is chapter 22, verse 15. The angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. So the first time he said, stop, don't kill Isaac. This is the second time. And he said, I have sworn by myself, says Yahweh. I have sworn by myself, says Yahweh. So he's taking an oath. God, Yahweh is giving an oath. He says, I've sworn by myself because you have done this thing. What thing? Be, the, being willing to sacrifice your own son because you believe that I would raise him from the dead. Because you have done this one thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, and then he says the promises that, he's, that we're going to hear about over and over. In verse 17, there's an A and a B section to these promises. First, that I will bless you. Yes, bless you. I will make your seed many. Yes, many, like the stars of the heavens and like the sand that is on the seashore. And that's the same promise that we saw back in chapter 15. And B, and your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. And I, I think this is referring to the land. And then promise number two, and this is what Messiah and what the seed to come is. Verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So all the nations of the earth implies not only Israel, but the Gentiles as well. So this is the basis for the Abrahamic covenant that God swore an oath by himself to do it. And when we get to Hebrews, we see this developed a little bit more clearly, so it'll make more sense to you. So go to Hebrews chapter 6. So in chapter 6 of Hebrews, now I'm reading from the REV, that's the Revised English Version, that's available on free online from STF. If you go there, you'll see how to get to it. Um, so in verse 13, it says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. So what does that mean? So if you go to court and you swear to test the whole, to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God, you're swearing by God, right? Or when you're in a discussion with somebody and, uh, Somebody's accusing you of something or say that, say that they were accusing you of stealing something or didn't not showing up or you something, and you say, I swear to God I didn't do that. That is swearing by something greater than yourself. So we're humans, we swear to God. God is my witness, I didn't do that, or whatever. But God, He doesn't have anybody to swear to because He's God, right? He doesn't have anybody higher than Him to swear to. So He swears by Himself right? So God says, I swear by myself. And then he says, saying, surely I will bless you greatly, and I will multiply you abundantly. And that was, he's just restating the promise that, that God made to Abraham. And thus, now he's talking about Abraham, and thus having patiently endured, he, Abraham, obtained the promise. So he did get Isaac. And Isaac kept right on going for the descendants of Abraham. In verse 16, for people swear by that which is greater than themselves, like we do. So we swear to God. And for them, an oath given for confirmation is an end to every dispute. What more do you want from me? I swear to God. That's the end of the, end of the argument, right? In verse 17, in the same way, God, intending to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, guaranteed it with an oath. An oath is when you swear. 
verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things. So what are the two unchangeable things? He promised and he made an oath. Those are the two unchangeable things. And since God, and I'll say him, in each of which it is impossible for God to lie. That's verse 18. We have strong encouragement. So because of these things, we have strong encouragement. We who have found refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. So that kind of explains a little bit between a covenant oath, in this case, the oath that God took was a covenant oath and the promise. And those two things give us hope. So we'll go on now to the Mosaic Covenant, kind of review a little bit of that. The principles of the Mosaic Covenant uh, is that it's temporary, administrative, administrative means lots of rules and regulations, and conditional, where the people had to do the law. Now, under the Mosaic Covenant, there was no guarantee for salvation, so people did not do the Mosaic Covenant, did not follow the law in order to be righteous. What happened with following the law was you were either blessed or you were cursed. So if you followed the law, you could receive blessings from God. If you didn't follow the law, you would receive curses. And then finally, the New Covenant. The New Covenant is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant, so it has similar foundational principles. It's based on faith in Christ. It has a promise of life in the age to come, and it's unconditional. It's a gift from, for your faith. You receive it as a gift. So in previous teachings over the past few months, we've been going over the reasons for the Mosaic Covenant. And this helps understand a little bit of development of why did God do the law if he was going to ab abolish the law in the future? And there are several reasons. And most of these reasons, I was just realizing this today, that most of these reasons point to, to Christ. They make it available for us, for human beings to come to Christ and seek salvation. So we're going to review these a little bit, uh, not in the depth, of, depth that we did before, but the number one reason, uh, not that it's more important than any other reason, but it's just first, uh, is to reveal a full knowledge of sin, including the hideous nature of sin. So turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and in verse 20, is a familiar verse. It says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be declared righteous in his sight. So that's, again, emphasizing that through you didn't become righteous or you don't become righteous by following the law. For through the law comes only the full knowledge of sin. So the first in line for the reason of the law is that it teaches us what sin is. It has a long list of rules and regulations, over 600 laws. So then we'll move on to the second purpose. The second purpose of the law is to make mankind aware of our sinfulness and our weakness. So we have a sin nature, and we're too weak to overcome our sin nature. So it makes us aware of that to the point where we experience brokenness and realize that we need a, to be rescued. And in order to be rescued, we need a Savior. So this is the second purpose of the law, uh, and we'll get into that in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And chapter 3, verse 19, we'll do the first part of the verse. This is a very important verse. It has hours of teaching you can do on this one verse. So the, in verse 19, it says, why was the law given? Oh, that's what we're talking about. Why then was the law given? It was added because of transgressions. So that is, transgressions are sin. So it's specifically referring to the behavior. So we learned what sin was back in Romans, and now we see that we can't follow the law. We are sinful, and so that's why the law was added. So the commandment itself, the law, is holy and righteous, but we can't keep the law because of our sin nature. And we keep bringing the penalty of death down upon ourselves. So in Romans 7, we went through, we're not going to go through that today, but the summary of Romans chapter 7, because this is the one where it's talking about every time I want to do something right, I do something wrong. I just can't help myself. I'm just a mess. 
And so this is the, from the REV commentary. I want to read what was written in there. This is a summary of verse, Romans chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual. Why is it spiritual? Because God gave it. But I am of the flesh, having been sold as a slave to sin. I know this because I do not understand my own actions. For I'm not practicing what I want, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. So that's our human nature, right? We just, we try to do what's right and we keep screwing up. So the Mosaic Covenant and the law was given because of sin, because of that nature, but it wasn't given so that sin would come. So the law was not weak in that regard, but we're weak. We're weak as human beings, and that is why the law was given. So in Romans chapter 7, I do want you to read these last couple of verses. So in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. So after we get to that point where we realize how weak we are and how wretched we are and how we were addicted to everything and we're, we can't do what we're supposed to do, in verse 24, Paul writes, wretched man that I am. You come to that full realization that I am a wretched, depraved person. I cannot begin to be righteous by following the law. Who will rescue, rescue me out of this body of death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Jesus has redeemed us <clears throat> from the curse of the law, or from the curse that came upon us because we were trying to follow the law. Okay, And the law teaches us because of this corruption, we can't do it. We can't do self-reliance. We can't do I do it myself. It breaks man down to realize that he needs a Savior. You know, I think of that, you know, the 12 steps in AA. The first step is to admit that before you can do the other steps to recovery. So not only do we have a sin nature, but we're weak. And just a reminder of verse, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do this study because it's, it's a little more technical, but I'm gonna read verse nine in Corinthians 12. Uh, you don't have to turn there. And this is after Paul had, uh, pleaded with Christ to remove his thorns in the flesh. He said, Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power reaches its fulfillment in weakness. So in this weakness, so when we're overcome by all of our problems and whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever they are, and we can't get healed or cured or fixed right at that moment, that when we're our weakest is when Jesus Christ's power and the power of salvation, the power of promise in the age to come, reaches its full strength and full power. So let's get to number three here as far as reasons for the law. So the, the next one is that the, the law held the Abrahamic covenant in place. And we'll understand what that means a little bit. Until the seed comes, we know that the seed is Jesus. It was, a t remember, it was a temporary conditional administrative covenant to help hold Israel together so that they wouldn't disperse until Messiah came. So now flip back to Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to go to the rest of verse 19. So we read the first part, that the law was added because of transgressions, because of sin. And now the second part until the seed for whom the promise was intended should come. So the law was given until. So there was a period of time after the law was given that was going to hold things in place until the seed came. So it was temporary. Okay. So until the seed who the promise was intended should come, we got to find out who the seed is. We already sort of know that. So I'll go back up a few verses into verse 16, same chapter, Galatians chapter 3. And it says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham. Promises, we read those promises in Genesis chapter 22, right? The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. 
it does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, which is Christ. So now we know that clearly that that seed is Christ. And that, remember that verse, and I'll just read it to you from Genesis 22, 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So we know that Jesus Christ is a descendant of Abraham. We know that this seed from Genesis 22, verse 18, is a prophecy about the Messiah and that that is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So we've seen that the seed was prophesied in Genesis 22, and we've seen who the seed is in Galatians chapter 3. And just as a side point that this, I don't know whether God showed me this or this just came to me this week when I was doing this. But I want to read a verse to you that's received some controversy, and that concerns the incorruptible seed. Some people think that the incorruptible seed is the word itself. But after our understanding of who the seed is, I want to read this verse to you and see if you think you know who the seed is when it comes to this verse. For you have been born again. This is 1 Peter, 1st chapter, verse 23. 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, not from corruptible seed, but from incorruptible. So from incorruptible seed through the living and enduring word of God. So that's just my, for, for me, that just is so clear that that incorruptible seed is Jesus Christ. And we're born with Christ in us, the hope of glory. Okay, we'll move on to number four. So the Mosaic law, this is the fourth reason, helped restrain sin so that man is able to come to Christ. So it provided protection and instruction, and it guarded Israel from blowing up and destroying themselves, um, and it was our guardian tutor to help restrain the sin. So in Galatians, move down further in chapter 3 to verse 23, and it says, but before the coming of the trust in Christ, or faith in Christ, so there was a time when the, we didn't have the faith in Christ, right, before that. We were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the faith that was about to be revealed. So what was the faith that was about to be revealed? Well, from Romans, we know that it's the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a free gift by grace. That is the faith that came. So we were imprisoned until that faith came that was about to be revealed. Verse 24, so then the law has been our guardian tutor until Christ, so that we could be declared righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian tutor. So the law was temporary, and we're no longer under the guardian tutor. So now we're getting to the, some new material. Uh, the fifth reason why, uh, the law was given, is to identify and establish Israel as a nation of a national identity. And this connects with us too, because as, as members of the household of faith, uh, as re in the age of grace receiving salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, we are a holy nation too. And we have to be an example to other nations and to other people that look to us. And so this was what the law was doing at that time. So Israel had just been freed from Egypt. They were slaves. Who were they? They weren't a nation. They were just a group of slaves, you know, who had been freed walking in the desert. So they needed to be made into a nation uh, and a, a nation of priests and God's own possession. So we're going to move down to um, 1 Peter again chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 6. And this is a connection for establishing us as a nation, and then we'll relate it back to when the Israelites were established as a nation. 
And he writes in verse six, he says, for it stands in scripture. Look, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone. And whoever believes in him will absolutely not be put to shame. This precious stone, then the cornerstone, then is for you who believe. So for us who believe, it's a cornerstone. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone over which they stumble and a rock over which they fall. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word. To this result, they were also appointed. Now, some people have taken that, they've appointed to that as being a sign of predestination. The Calvinists really love that verse. But it's not appointed, it's predestined. And that means that God did not predestine some people to disobey, but rather he planned that the people who willfully chose to disobey would stumble and fall. In other words, if you disobey the word, you have an appointment with stumbling and falling. Make sense? If you jump out of a building, you have an appointment with the ground. <laughs> okay, so it's like that. But in verse nine, in contrast to those who are disobedient and stumble and fall, but you, people speaking to us now, the believers now, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for God's own possession. Why? So that you can proclaim the glorious attributes of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Verse 10, at one time you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. At one time you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we now are a chosen people. And I think this is, we're chosen to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people of God's own possession. So that when people look at us, they see that we're people of God and that the Gentiles, the other, the non-believers can be attracted to God and to Jesus Christ. So let's go back in, in time a little bit to understand these, uh, these four attributes of being a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and people of God's own possession. So go to Isaiah, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, and we'll do verse 20. The animals of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. Verse 21, the people that I form for myself, why? that they might set forth my praise. So we're chosen as a people formed for God's purpose to set forth his praise. So then we'll go on a little bit to, to, so I think that we're chosen for these other three things. So to be a people of his own possession. And so, this takes us back to the, to the giving of the law and what God's intention for, for us along those lines were. And the giving of the law, remember this occurred uh, after the people were re re released from Egypt. They're going over to Mount Sinai. And while they were still in Egypt, God delivered this message to them. And in Exodus uh, chapter six, Exodus chapter six. And this ties into what I started with the beginning about how, as you have a better knowledge of covenants, you see this word covenant, covenant faithfulness in the Bible all the time, and you tend to just gloss over it until you have developed that little different understanding. And so this is after Moses had already confronted Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had tightened the screws to put more pressure on them and taken the straw out of the bricks and stuff like that. And verse one, chapter six of Exodus, Yahweh said to Moses, now you're going to see what I will do to Pharaoh, for my strong hand 
he will let them go. And by a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. Verse two, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh, I was not known to them. Verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. So there's a usage of the word covenant. I wouldn't have paid much attention to that before, but we saw that those Abrahamic problems. So which, which covenant is this that he's talking about? The Abrahamic covenant. I've established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their travels in which they lived as aliens. Verse 5, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So he remembered that promise that he made, that he would give them heirs, and those were the heirs that he was talking to right there, and uh, the promise of the land. So after the Exodus then, uh, after, or after these, these verses, uh, then there's the plagues and the Red Sea story and all that, and they're off to Mount Sinai. And it took about, some people figure, about 45 days uh, to go from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, and that uh, that was over a period of three months, so part of a month and then a month and then a part of another month, so it was over three months. And then after they were there, and Moses made uh, multiple visits up and down the mountain, uh, they were there for about a year. Uh, and then they finally got the revelation for the tabernacle, built the tabernacle, and then they went and wandered in the wilderness for another 39 years. So it's important to know that Moses, if people don't realize this, I didn't realize this, was that Moses went up and down Mount Sinai seven times. And different things happened at different times when he was up the mountain. And we're going to go over the first time because it's important in developing this understanding that we, the children of Israel and us are both my own possession, kingdom of priests, and holy nation. So Exodus chapter 19, it says in verse 1, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mountain, the mountain of Mount Sinai. Verse 3, this is the first trip up the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him out of the mountain, saying, This is what you must tell the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Saying the same thing twice, right? Hey, Jacob was Israel. Verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5, now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. Now, what covenant is he talking about now? This is the, Abra uh, the Mosaic covenant. Because you have to keep the Mosaic covenant. There was no conditions on the Abrahamic covenant. So now there's conditions. <laughs> so he's talking about the Mosaic covenant. These are the laws that he's going to give Moses. He says, if you need obey my voice and keep my covenant, then a condition. You will be my own possession from all, from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the children of Israel. So God chose them to be his own possession, kingdom, priest, holy nation, if they obeyed the law. And that they would, he's establishing them, he's developing them to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, so that they can be examples to the world. So number two in, in developing God's own possession, go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in verse 6. For you are a holy people to Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession above all peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then go down to chapter 26 of Deuteronomy. And in verse 16, this day Yahweh, your God, command you to do these statutes and ordinances 
You must therefore keep and do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared Yahweh this day to be your God and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and listen to his voice. So this statutes, commandments, and ordinances, I did a little work on that this week. So there's, those words are used a lot interchangeably and they don't necessarily have a specific meaning different from one another. Although there's a little, some subtle differences when you look up the words, but it's like we might say uh, laws, rules, and regulations. We might say that. And to us, like a, the speed limit, the speed limit is 70. And that what established that speed limit? Laws, rules, and regulations. So, so those, it, it, it all encompasses everything, all the rules, everything. So there's not necessarily a, a, a big spiritual difference between those as far as I could, as far as I could tell. Um, <clears throat> where am I here? So in verse 18, and Yahweh has declared you this day to be a people for his own possession, as he has promised you, and that you should keep all his commandments. And verse 19, and to make you high above all nations that he has made in praise and in name and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to Yahweh your God, as he has spoken. So the third thing we have to look into is being a kingdom of priests. And when you're a kingdom of priests, you're serving uh, the Gentiles, you're serving other nations. Um, so in, in Genesis chapter 12, we'll go back to uh, the very first time that Abram is in Canaan and receiving promises from God. He says in verse 3, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse the ones who curse you, and all the clans of the earth will be blessed in you. So all the clans of the earth are the Gentiles. So as part of Abraham's future, part of the Abrahamic covenant and the, the developing and going toward the new covenant is that the message will get out to the Gentiles because we're a kingdom of priests. We're, we have a priestly duty to bring hold, hold forth God to the Gentiles. In Isaiah chapter 56, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 56, and in verse 6, it says, also the foreigners, the foreigners are the Gentiles, who join themselves to Yahweh to minister to him and to love the name of Yahweh to be his servants. So these are Gentiles being welcomed into the, into the Judaism. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and holds firmly to my covenant. Verse 7, even those, this covenant here is the Mosaic covenant, of course, because there's lots of rules. Verse 7, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Verse 8, the Lord Yahweh, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, yet will I gather others to him besides his own who are gathered. So the purpose of being a kingdom of priests is to hold forth God to the Gentiles. And then finally, being a holy nation. So we'll go back to Genesis again, chapter 12. And these are part of the opening promises that God makes to Abram when, he's, when he gets to the to promised land in Canaan. So he was in Haran, and he received the message to, to go. So he gets there, and then these are promises that God says to him. He says, verse 2, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So there's a promise that God is going to make Abraham and his descendants a great nation. So then go to Psalms 147. So God is giving Israel a national identity through whom the promises of the Abrahamic covenant can be mediated. Because that's the main thing, is this is getting to the new covenant where we have the Messiah and Jesus available which they didn't have at this time. The holy priesthood, which we just talked about, will make you a holy nation. So in Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, he declares his word to Jacob, or Israel, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. Verse 20, he has not acted this way for any other nation, 
and his judgments. They, the other nations, don't know them. Praise Yah. So he has called Israel at that time to be a holy nation because none of the other nations were holy. They didn't understand the, the statutes and the judgments. And this all marked Israel. Now think about this. This is a reputation that Israel had. Israel was God's people who he freed from Egypt. And that went before them. Everybody knew who they were, that God had done all these wonderful miracles. And he's now establishing them as a unique group of people. And so that's the, the final part of our teaching today is that, is that Israel uh, was set apart and established as a holy nation to go with the other four things that we developed. Sin, that the purpose of the law was to reveal a full knowledge of sin. Number two, to make mankind aware of his sinfulness. Three, hold the Abrahamic covenant in place. Four, to restrain sin by means of being a guardian tutor. Now there's other reasons that we're gonna work on in the future. Those include that the purpose of the law being to teach Israel how to worship with all the ceremonial law and to reveal the holiness of God. So that's all I got today. That was a lot for it to sit through. I appreciate it.